A world without stories? I can. It's kind of boring. You sit around at dinner parties. You read your drawings. You share your day planner. It's not the kind of world I want to live in. Stories and I go way back. You know, when I was a little girl, when I learned to read, I would be so excited when mom and dad went to bed at night. I would wait to hear their door close and I would flip my bedside table lamp back on so that I could jump right back into my book. <laughs> well, my mom, like every mother, had an innate sixth sense. She knew something was up so she would sneak as quietly as she could back to the bottom of the stairs to catch me. And I devised this, uh, dare I say it, ingenious ploy to hide. And what I would do is I'd take the bedside lamp into bed with me. And then I would pull the comforter over me and the lamp. And I'd read in this little like tent space so that the light wouldn't get out from under the door. Well, when mom ca caught me, and catch me she did, she was not amused. Kathleen Sarah Jane Murray. You know, she never called me that, but I could see it in her eyes. <laughs> Um, she promptly informed me that I had almost burned the whole house down along with my mom, uh, my dad, the poodle, my teddy bear collection, and my little baby brother, Jonathan. <laughs> so, fully repentant, um, the next day I went into the garage, I stole my dad's flashlight, I put it between the box spring and the mattress, and I resumed reading everything I could get my hands on. <laughs> Now, I remember the first book that really marked me as a child. And I know what you're thinking, but it wasn't Cinderella. I love that story. And it wasn't Nancy Drew. Uh, I was about seven, and it was a little paperback volume I took from my dad's bookshelf. And it had cartoon animals on the cover. Um, it was George Orwell's Animal Farm. <laughs> yeah. And my parents were puzzled by this choice, um, but they let me read it. And when I was done, my dad asked me, what did you think? And I told him, the pigs are not very nice people. I mean, everything gets off to a great start on the farm. They get rid of the oppressive farmer. You know, the animals are free. They put the Bill of Rights on the wall. And then the pigs get greedy and power hungry. So they sneak in at night and where they have things written like all animals are created equal, they add things like, but some animals are created more equal than others. Still to this day, decades later, I stand by my initial assessment as a seven-year-old. The pigs are not very nice people. <laughs> but you know what? There's something exceedingly profound in that statement of my seven-year-old seven self. And it's something so basic and fundamental about stories and so obvious that we don't say it enough. Stories are about people. Whether we're immersed in a story about a clownfish, or a lasagna-obsessed cat, or maybe a little creature with large, hairy feet that finds a ring of power. Stories are there to challenge us, you and me, to think about the way we live our lives and the choices we make, especially when confronted with hard decisions. And that's one of the reasons stories are so special. It's why we carry them with us throughout our whole life. Um, and that's related also to this amazing thing that happens in your brains when you're participating in a story. You see, when you fall in love with a character, your brain releases oxytocin, the bonding chemical that creates empathy or love. And when you wrestle with that character through the hardest moments of trials and tribulations, you get stressed out too. Your brain produces cortisol, the stress hormone. And the world of the story is so new and so exciting that you get completely addicted to it, as I did as a child. That newness creates a release of dopamine, and that sears the experience and in your memory forever. So there you have it. Oxytocin, cortisol, dopamine, the OCD of insanely great storytelling. Why does all of this matter? Well, you know, it matters because we know now that there's no such thing as just a story for entertainment value. Stories are rife with values. They communicate worldviews. They teach us how to act and how to respond to situations that mirror and imitate life.
They invite us into a journey, and that journey affects everything we look at when we stop reading the book or walk away from the theater or turn the TV off. They stay with us, and they influence choices in our real lives. For me, the best kinds of stories mark a clear difference between right and wrong. <clears throat> I mean, let's think about it. You remember the end of the, the first Star Wars trilogy? <laughs> Nobody is rooting for the Emperor. Everybody, deep down inside, wants Luke's father to help him and save him. And nobody walks away from Shakespeare's Macbeth thinking, I want to be just like Macbeth. <laughs> I mean, that's sort of like watching Breaking Bad and deciding you want to be just like Walter White, make all the same decisions as him, and devote your life to cooking crystal. <laughs> That's not the point of the story, right? Stories are an extraordinary form of collaboration. Across time and space, we pass them down from generation to generation. They change the way we look at our lives, they change the way we look at ourselves, and they change how we live. Stories are the ethical markers of our time. And it's when we muddy that line between right and wrong, when we start rewarding injustice, or we use a story just to sell us something we don't even need, or to buy into an ideology we don't even understand, then we're living not much differently than those animals on the farm, confused, distracted, disconnected from everything that really matters. Throughout history, stories have been used for great good and great evil. But I promise you one thing, they will never be neutral. <laughs>